The North Dakota. The US Navy's first true dreadnought. Okay, that's gonna cause upset, but let me explain. The USN, for many years, finds itself in a similar position as the French Navy finds itself in. And that the people who make triple expansion engines are very good at getting congressional support. And there is some truth in what they're saying. That due to the need for having range, especially pre- Widening, sorting things out with a Panama Canal. You need triple expansion engines. Or rather, you can justify triple expansion engines. Especially prior to the whole uh, electric drive system, which the Americans get into. And those triple expansion engines, in theory, are going to give you greater range, greater efficiency. However, however, we turn to this lovely book, which is, of course, Singford Brayer's Battleships and Battle Cruisers, 1905 to 1970. We turn to Delaware and North Dakota. We look at these ships, we look at the lovely writings it has about them. And we go, well, okay, in their trial runs, the Delaware managed to get 28,570 indicated horsepower. That's 21.44 knots. North Dakota generated 33,875 indicated horsepower. That's over 5,300 more indicated horsepower, and achieved 21.83 knots, we're told. What's even more interesting is when you realise that North Dakota achieves a longer range. And when I say a longer range, I mean a substantially longer range. 6,500 nautical miles at 12 knots versus 6,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. Now, when you start looking at this, you're sort of going, why? This is strange. Well, here is the thing. Just because on paper, and according to all logic, the triple expansion engines should be more efficient than the turbines they're producing, especially as considering their le relative generational technology. In terms of how mature the technology is, how used the infrastructure and industry is to producing it. You would certainly expect the triple expansion engine to be the more efficient one. That does not take fully into account the ability of defense contractors in any period to muck that one up. Okay? On paper, if you're looking at designs on paper, and this is one of the things where I always tell people, I, I always try and read history forward. I always start at the very beginning and work my way forward. And I was looking, starting off the North Dakotas for this one, and it was, I had to remind myself of this all. Because I started off looking at their plans and working through from their plans I could download and could look up, look at and use, although I can't use in today's video. I was looking up going, hmm, well, North Dakota's going to have a higher cruising speed, but she's going to have a far shorter range. She's probably going to have a higher top speed as well, but she's going to have a shorter range. Because, you know, the way it's all structured, that, that's the intuitive thing, that's the logical thing. And you look through and you look at the actual results and you look at the actual actions of how they, they are when working and you go, Oh! Great! Someone mucked up. 
So, Newport News, who built Delua, managed to somehow muck up. Whereas Four River Shipyard, or Quincy, who built North Dakota, managed to build a honey horse. To use a phrase, one of my cousins who's coming over for the birthday bonanza from Texas, I think she is, likes to use to describe things which are absolutely amazing and work better than expected. So, this is what is today's sh key ship. What I consider the first true dreadnought of the US Navy, and the unintentional honey horse of their earlier ships. And this is despite her having the issues she did, because this is not a ship which has necessarily the uh, easiest life. You know, uh, the commander of the American Expeditionary Force actually felt that her turbine engines were too unreliable for her to be deployed to the war zone. And in 1917, her turbines are replaced with new geared turbines, along with new fire control. And in 1917, she really steps up to the plate. So, she has very good, but unreliable you could argue, turbine engines to begin with. But her next generation ones, the ones fitted to her in 1917, oh my. Then, she's the ship which does one of the most important diplomatic visits the US Navy does in the 1920s. Technically, it's 1919, but um, mm, almost gets there for 1920. They're returning the remains of Vincenzo Macchi de Salarea, the Italian ambassador to Europe. That was her second trip to Europe. She's a good-looking ship. Oh, shameless book plug. What can I say? I just really like it selling. And that's not just because the more copies it sells, the more it <coughs> warms up <laughs> some of my colleagues. In a good way, okay? It's not not actually causing them physical pain. It's just... winding them up. Okay? Just a little bit. It's just fun. Academia. We... We have fun over the small things, because let's be honest, we don't have the money for the big things. <laughs> Ay, caramba. So... The first true U.S. Andrena, and look at those lines. Now, if you can get past seeing the masts, and I mean just somehow block those things out of your eye line, if you can do that, and just look at the hull, look at the shaping of the ship, You very quickly see it's a really interesting work of art. It is a powerful statement of the United States. These guns are raised up high, they're raised up proud. And please note, Delaware looks just as good. Okay, again, she's a good ship, and 
please don't get me wrong when I say the the triple expansion dreadnoughts the US in the house are good ships. Most of the time, there are the things work out exactly as they're supposed to. They work out exactly as they should do in terms of, oh yeah, higher cruising speed, slightly higher top speed turbines, more, longer range, more efficiency from the triple expansion engines. Yeah. That's what it normally works out as. Not necessarily a massive amount of difference in terms of a spot top speed, but it works out that way. And they're not bad ships. I might not consider them true to uh, true dreadnoughts, but that's because the benchmark, and I've done a video about benchmark navies. It, it actually went live tonight when I'm recording this, and. As usual, when I go for a slightly more abstract topic, it doesn't necessarily do as well as me just putting up BIGGEST BATTLESHIP. That does better. But... This, it has to be compared to the benchmark. And the benchmark are the dreadnoughts. But is HMS Dreadnought. Of the, be uh, dre uh, the benchmark, surprise enough, of Dreadnought battleships is HMS Dreadnought. And she's turbine powered. Because that's the new engine system coming in. And that's what they've chosen to try and achieve her speed and her operation capabilities. And so that's what you're comparing them to. And yes, you can have perfectly good reasons for not going with turbines. But then you're not building to the benchmark. And you're making a reason for why you're doing it. So, true Dreadnought. But North Dakota is a good ship. Her career? Well... That is a lot of things crammed into that. What's interesting about her career, really, is that even a decision was made in nineteen in World War One that her turbines might not be up to it in terms of going across to Europe, and they waited till they upgraded in nineteen seventeen to geared steam turbines. She'd already visited Europe. In 1910, she did a goodwill visit to Britain and France. So in the court, North Dakota, what I think happens with the turbines, and this happens with a lot of the early first generation of turbines, so this is an, in this is an interesting thing to think about because they last as long as they do, and they do do what they do, and they're as capable as they are. Another reason why I think she's a honey horse of a ship. Is that the turbines, especially the earlier turbines, they have a half-life. They age fast. In fact, one of the reasons why Dreadnought ends up where she does with the Channel Squadron is because of her own turbine maintenance issues. Now, actually, turns out Parsons have managed to get more of the stuff right. Let's be honest, Parsons, when making the turbines for HMS Dreadnought, realised exactly how important those turbines were going to be. And this was the person who'd come up with the turbines, come up with the idea, had been pushing turbines, knew exactly what he was doing for the Royal Navy. I'm fairly certain the turbines that are put into HMS Dreadnought were laboured over by Charles Parsons himself every single day while they were being built in his yards. I think they probably per he probably personally nursemaided them. Because, let's be honest, 
anything went wrong with them, there couldn't be a more high profile, oh, sugar, your company mucked up, could there? And there were a lot of people who wanted him to fail. There were a lot of people who wanted him to fail. Sardas, all those engineering companies selling, uh, selling triple expansion, quadruple expansion engines. They sound really efficient. They are. But no, North Dakota is used a lot. She comes across to the UK, to France, as said. Uh, she does training cruises for the Naval Academy in 1912 and 1913. In January 1913, she's actually used as the honour escort for HMS Natal, which was returning the remains of Whitelaw Reed, the US ambassador to Great Britain, to America. Again, this is an important thing to think about. We don't think about this today because today, if an ambassador died abroad, A, it would be a very rare occurrence. B, they'd be loaded on a plane and flown back. By tradition, the host nation would provide the ship, would get them home as quickly as possible. It was a sign of respect, a sign of honour that they did so. And so, when ships were involved in this, this was high-stakes diplomacy. This was high-stakes representation of the Navy. The Navy, which was sending their ship with the remains aboard, would send their very best ship they could. And what level of ship you were sending would be taken into account. So... The British sent HMS Natal, an armoured cruiser. A very, very, well, how do I put this politely? New armoured cruiser. More importantly, top speed, 23 knots. And able to go nearly 8,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. She was a warrior class. They picked her because she could get across the Atlantic Quickly. And in 1913, that mattered. Let's be honest, the only other options to go for something faster would have been to use a battle cruiser. And I'm sure they considered that. But it was their, their locations, how quickly they could get one to the suitable place, in suitable order, to go. Because the other thing is, a lot of ceremonial things have to be done when you get there. You have to have an honor guard, you have to... You need a very well worked up and drilled crew. So, you're looking for the fastest, best ship you have with the best crew you have. That's available to go right now. That's a criteria. Both Dakota and Delaware have a similar layout. They have their boiler rooms and they have their engine rooms. And that's actually the reason for why the ship's guns are positioned the way they are. You might have looked at them earlier and think, thought, well, hang on, why, aren't, why isn't this turret next to here and pointing its guns aft and... Surely that would make things easier in terms of weight distribution. Well, when you've got your boilers all situated there and you've got your magazines and you're trying to keep them cool, that's how it's structured out. Now, best magazines for keeping, their, uh, keeping everything nice is these ones. Making sure the powder is at the correct temperature, making sure the guns are at the correct temperature. Next best, these are the aft. The engine room doesn't create anywhere near as much heat as the boiler rooms. Absolutely a uh, terrible magazines, which the, the Americans are constantly working on to try and improve, and it's the main lessons for where they start to go, hang on, temperature really does have an effect on this. Oh, it does. These ones. Trap between the boiler rooms and the engine rooms.
Now, it's unsurprising that these ships, especially North Dakota, were some of the vessels sent to steam off Veracruz when there were issues there with Mexico during their revolution in 1914. And then she took part, along with her sister, in the... How can I put this? The Americans warming up for war. This happens in both World War One and World War Two. The Americans see the war break out. They don't join. But most of their forces are fairly certain at some point we're going to end up joining this mess, aren't we? Yes, we are. Great. We'd better start training then. And so they do. They go off and do a lot of training. And the Atlantic Fleet especially does a huge amount of training. A huge amount of training. This really works in some ships, and some of the earlier turbine ships, this is where they start to develop problems, because the turbines are being heavily used. Very heavily used. <laughs> Please note, just in a, a side and a 4 fall break, I have been playing around, well, when I say play around, I have been trying to adjust the settings on the new mic to get them right. I'd managed to get the old mic right, and then it's it managed to break itself. The new mic... I think I'm getting there. I think it's getting good. Because I noticed there was a lot of sharpness coming through, especially once I put the videos through the enhance of the sound system. And I tried to modulate that down by taking the gain down just a bit. Just a little bit down on the gain. But. It's a constant work in progress. And it's me listening back to videos. And for some reason there's sometimes very much a difference in the terms of the video I hear. Once I've recorded it and put it through all the processing on my computer. And the video you hear on YouTube. So... Any advice, any help, any suggestions, always gratefully received, especially if they're constructive. Someone just commented the other day, tangy sound, and I was going, is that a good thing, bad thing? Is tangy a slang for good stuff, something good, or does it mean it's tangy as in it's sounding metallic and high-pitched? Context, please. I'm a historian. Not a sound engineer. So, when you look at these ships, you will see there is a huge amount of similarity according to their stated, please note that, stated stats. And it's rather fun when you work through it and you look at them and go, wow, you did really well. Well, we know for starters that the 21 knots is lying because we know one achieves... 21.83 knots, and the other one doesn't do bad either. It's, you know, the thing is, the US Navy does not build necessarily the fastest ships in the world, but they don't build bad ships either. 21.44 knots for Delaware, 21.83 knots for North Dakota. The really interesting thing to me, the really interesting thing to me, is that both are designed with a stated speed, stated power of 25,000 shaft horsepower. That's what they're supposed to be achieving. And yet, one generates 28,570 indicated horsepower. That's the Delaware. And the other, 33,875 indicated horsepower. I've said these figures before at the beginning. There is an efficiency issue going on here. If truly it's 25,000 shaft horsepower getting through, for both there's a bit of an efficiency issue going on. But for Dakota, there is a far bigger issue. Because if she's really de de generating that much more indicated horsepower,
yes, there are issues with the direct drive turbines. In terms of getting the power through at this point. But she could have been a much faster ship. Okay, let me quantify that. For the period, she could have possibly been a 23 knot ship. On that indicated horsepower. Wouldn't that have been amazing? If the USN had managed to launch a ship which was a 23 knot dreadnought. If they'd stuck with that then, well, that could have added a whole new dimension to the qualitative race with the British going on. Because this is part of the qualitative race. She's super firing guns fore and aft. The British were building those lovely wing turrets. Ooh. So she has got a 10 gun broadside from the get go. Rather than 8. She's capable of 21 knots. And she's turbine powered. This is a challenge even in this form, even with her speed, etc. This is a challenge in the qualitative race. This is turning around to the British and going, yeah, we've just built a design and oh, it's super firing and it's got these. And the really bad thing for the British, the really bad thing for the British, and this is something which again, shows some of the issues with Admiral Fisher. Is that the South Carolinas have been the same? They were super firing. Their guns were on the center line. Now you can argue they don't have the six forward firing guns, which Admiral Fisher insisted were an absolute priority. They have four. True. But the British accepted four with the Orions. They accepted four with the Queen Lazarus. They accepted four with all sorts of ships, so why not? This is the point about the qualitative race. It brings out the best in both sides. It really does. Because this is the USN achieving the benchmark, but going further than the benchmark. They produced a ship which is matches in with Drenor in every single way, apart from it exceeds it in its broadside firepower. British can't go, oh, we've got, well, yes, but you're still using triple expansion engines, aren't you? They're good, yes, and you're, you're achieving good speed with them, yes. But still, it's triple expansion. They can't say that with North Dakota. And this is the start of what really develops with the US Navy's battle fleet. As said, she gets to Europe many times. She really does. She has the issues with her turbines in the sort of the first period when they are looking at the first group to deploy over. And they send her in and they replace her turbines. And that's another advantage, let's be honest. If you have your engine room built like that, boiler rooms are down here, but engine rooms down here. That's actually far easier to get through. You have to get through like two decks. One armoured deck, lift up, Whew. hello, we're at the turbines, lift them out, put in new ones. These are 
twin shaft designs. Twin shaft designs. They're achieving 21 knots. And they are designed, although I have a feeling this was unintentional benefit, but I don't know if this was actually intentional to make the engine rooms that easy to access and repair, but they did. And so they were easy to upgrade. And so in 1919, there is North Dakota sitting in the Grand Harbor in Malta. Looking absolutely resplend resplendent there. Which is ultimately what the USN wants to be. The USN wants to project itself around the world. The USN is growing into itself. One of the interesting things of, and an interesting question to consider, is if the US Navy had continued on developing and evolving itself post World War One, instead of going through the many cuts and uh, financial crises induced by Congress and the treaty system, what could the USN have looked like by what time of World War Two? It's a really impressive fleet. And whilst you can argue it starts with the South Carolinas and it starts with Teddy Roosevelt's campaigns while well, he's president and even before that, truly, I'd say it starts with North Dakota. Because when she comes out, she shows they are able to build to match the best in the world, a.k.a. the benchmark. She's launched in 1908. Launched in 1908. They caught up with the benchmark in two years. And there's no, oh yes, this is equivalently as good or anything like that. No, this one is as good, if not better. Arguably better because of the greater world side. That is something to be proud of. She finishes her career as, well, a radio-controlled gunnery target ship. Her turbines were removed. This is her 1917 turbines were removed and uh, for use aboard the USS Nevada when that vessel was modernized in the 1930s. But she served as a gunnery target ship from 1924 till 1930. Replaced that role by USS Utah. And is stricken in 1931 from the register and sold for dismantling in March 1931. She never got to fight a really big battle. She got to see the Ostfriedland tests. She got to do so many important visits. So much so that you could argue she was one of the most important ships of the US Navy in terms of diplomatic service and national representation of the period. She certainly did a lot for that. Which brings us really to her question the question. 
question that should be really asked when you talk about these ships, because whilst I said I would have loved and was tempted by the idea of a question about what happens if the US Navy is allowed to continue developing to its full capability? What happens if the Congress doesn't muck around, if various things don't go wrong? What happens if they get that? But I can't really ask that question. That's a massive question. That's a question I would do a video over, and I'd probably still be talking about two and a half hour video. By the way, thanks to all the comments from people who've gone, I would watch a three hour, four hour, five hour, six hour video. I have done a few of those. Not as many as my good friend Drak NFL, but I've done a few. The trouble is, the stats I get are that if I do a one and a half hour video, about 35% are watching to the end, roughly. If I do a two hour video, it's dropped down to roughly 25%. And if I'm doing over two hours, even by not that much, five, ten minutes, it seems to drop down according to YouTube stats down to 10% or less. And the thing is, that means, and this is the thing where it's annoying being a lecturer, you get the idea of, hang on, I'm supposed to structure my lecture so my students listen to the whole way through. And students, audience, listening the whole way through. And so that starts to wear on your mind. You start to think, how can I do this? So I'm trying to structure them for the roughly 75 minute, 90 minute mark in terms of long patrols and... Well, these I've given up on making 20 minutes, but I'm trying to keep them to roughly 40. This one might even be under 40. A couple of them have been. A few seconds. No, the question for this has to do with North Dakota and the US Navy. And the question is, what happens if North Dakota really doesn't work? If her turbines aren't as good? Because let's consider it. The next class that comes after her they are the Floridas. And they, well, let's be honest, have Parsons steam turbines. Or Curtis, but they have turbines. It's the same with the Wyomings. It's the same with all the successors after this. They go over to a turbine navy. And the capabilities as such. Well, they improve dramatically and US infrastructure grows. But what happens if North Dakota is not good? What happens if North Dakota doesn't work? And the USN, this Air Force decides we have to stick with triple expansion steam engines or quadruple expansion steam engines. How do you think that affects the US Navy going forward? How do you think that affects the US Navy as they move forward into what they become? Into the classes that become the standard class battleships. North Dakota was a success, and we can say that because she's used as a justification for the transfer onto steam turbines. That's good. She is that justification. If she'd failed, though, the US Navy could well have kept to the triple expansion, quadruple expansion, whichever variation the expansion engine is they're going for. 
Probably they've improved them. I think they'd probably be using a version of the quadruple expansion engine, but they might try for even more. They might even go for a quintuple expansion engine. There is a theoretical possibility of it. It is mooted at one point, but I think... I think Curtis. But I would have to check that up. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. It's just... I remember reading in an old book an advertisement, and I think it was Curtis. But I could be completely wrong on that, so please do not quote me. That is, it just popped up in my head the entire image of the advertisement. So I'll leave that in here. Just but, yeah. So thank you, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. This is going to be over forty minutes long. <laughs>